Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we're very, very happy uh, to have uh, Bobby Kleinberg here from Cornell. Uh, we've been wanting him to come for a long visit for a long, long time, and it finally happened. So he's going to be here throughout uh, the year until June, and uh, uh, he's going to talk to us about Explore, Exploit, Reflections on an Ancient Dilemma in the Age of the Web. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Yael. I'm absolutely delighted to be at MSR this year. And I'm, uh, I've already met a lot of you, and I'm looking forward to meeting some more of you. So uh, by way of introducing my talk, I want to tell you about one of my favorite children's books, Toot and Puddle, which is the story of two pigs that live together in the woods. Toot is an adventurer who loves to travel and see the world. And Puddle is uh, a pig that prefers to stay and enjoy the comforts of home. And uh, in the book, the entire story is told through a sequence of letters that they exchange as Toot uh, explores the Arctic and the Arabian Desert and goes scuba diving. And Puddle, meanwhile, writes back to him about uh, you know, enjoying the maple syrup from their trees and jumping in the pond. And uh, you know, a part of the book's appeal lies in its message that friendship can conquer this dilemma and you don't have to choose between whether to be adventuresome or whether to enjoy the simple pleasures. Um, you can do whichever one comes naturally to you and your friends will let you vicariously do the other. But, you know, life outside of children's books is more complicated than that. <laughs> and oftentimes you have to do one or the other and in fact, you know, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the main plot point in the story of the first people on earth <laughs> is that they had to decide whether to enjoy what was safe and comfortable or to gain some more knowledge about something different from what they already knew. So uh, at least from the standpoint of someone giving this talk, under a very self-serving interpretation of the Judeo-Christian tradition, what it's saying is that the quintessential defining feature of humanity is to face this dilemma, whether to explore or exploit. And so it's kind of amazing that, uh, you know, given that this has been with us since the first people on Earth, mathematicians have not been treating this uh, as a serious question of research until about my grandparents' generation. Uh, and since then, there's been a line of work on so-called multi-armed bandit problems, which will be the star of this talk, that attempt to quantify this dilemma and make predictions about what you should do in quantitative terms when faced with explore or exploit dilemmas. And, uh, but you know, to say that this is a fundamentally human dilemma is actually framing things too narrowly. Because as computers have grown more autonomous, uh, now they're facing this dilemma all the time, too. And so in my generation, computer scientists have also adopted uh, this batch of problems as a serious batch of challenges that they must face in their research. And that's the main theme of my talk. Um, my first exposure to these problems was actually in a computational context, and I should tell you a little bit more about that to situate the issue for you. So uh, a dilemma that computers often face is that of finding the closest server. Um, there's some service that's replicated on uh, more than one server worldwide. And you know, my computer may have access to a directory that says it can obtain this service from any of these three servers. It now wants to request service from the nearest one. And this is something it's going to be doing repeatedly. So it wants to have a policy for choosing one server every time it asks for this service and minimizing the average response time it experiences. Um, so I became aware of this type of problem in distributed systems when I was working for Akamai, uh, the internet content delivery company across the street from us. 
which is in the enviable position of being able to be simultaneously toot and puddle. Uh, this is the Akamai mapping system, which is toot and is continually measuring the internet and finding out what's out there and finding out about new uh, properties of connectivity that were not the case one minute ago. And then there are the users who get to be puddle and whenever they make a query, they instantly get routed to what the model currently thinks is the best server for them. But you know, my laptop does not have the luxury of operating a network of 100,000 servers distributed worldwide that can be constantly measuring things. Instead, it has to run crude algorithms like this. Um, so here on the right side of the screen is what goes on when my computer looks up whitehouse.gov. It finds out that there are seven authoritative name servers for that name. It has to ask one of them, okay, what's the address of whitehouse.gov? And a commonly used algorithm uh, is you keep a vector of scores for each server. Whenever you have a query, you ask the server with the minimum score. You measure how long it takes to respond in milliseconds, increment the score by that number of milliseconds, and crucially, decrement everybody else's score by one millisecond. So what is this algorithm doing? It's doing some crude trade-off between exploration and exploitation because um, you know, if one of them is five milliseconds away and another is 100 milliseconds away, then I'm almost always going back to the one that's five milliseconds away. But every so often, the decrementing the counter for the other one means that I'll try it out and uh, I'll find out if, in fact, that server is only one millisecond away from me, and the 100 was an outlier measurement that just happened sometime in the past because whatever, there was congestion on the line and it took a while to respond to me. Okay, so this is a crude algorithm for doing both exploration and exploitation in the context of looking up servers. Once you become aware of this issue, you see it all over the place in computer systems. So for example, what does Amazon need to do when they serve up their front page to you? They, they actually face a lot of explore exploit dilemmas just in creating this page. They have to decide which products they're going to advertise to you. They have a choice of whether to display the Columbia men's double barrel camouflage handbag there or some other product. Um, for that matter, who says the price has to be $29.99? Maybe they could make more money selling it to you if they said the price was $34.99. Why don't they explore other prices a little bit? Um, and so almost everybody operating an ongoing service in the world of computers now needs to be running an algorithm that figures out how it's going to do this kind of experimentation to improve its service and keep track of changing conditions over time. And this is a very rudimentary algorithm for which I was able to give a hand-waving justification, but I haven't even told you a mathematical model yet, so we don't even have a framework for asking a question like, is it the best algorithm? Well, it turns out that at least one version of that framework existed decades ago, uh, around the time of the very first computers or even a bit earlier. That is the multi-armed bandit problem. In general terms, a multi-armed bandit problem concerns a decision maker, who in this talk I will often refer to as a gambler, repeatedly choosing one of n actions, which in this talk I will frequently call arms. And the metaphor comes from an array of slot machines, each of which has one arm you can pull. A slot machine is called by some people a one-armed bandit because it takes your money away from you as surely as a bandit does. And at every time step, the gambler picks one of these actions. It produces a random payoff from some distribution that's not known to the gambler. You get to observe that history of payoffs, and the goal is to design a policy which over time maximizes the expected total payoff. So that is a sketchy definition of the multi-armed bandit problem. I'll be more formal about it later, but first let me delve a bit into the history of this problem. Um, so I like this quotation from Peter Whittle, who was one of the early theorists of multi-armed bandits in the decision sciences. Um, 
So it says the multi-armed bandit problem was so baffling to allied scientists during World War II that they made the joking suggestion that it, the multi-armed bandit problem itself should be dropped over Germany as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage. <laughs> uh, uh, interestingly, this quotation leaves out any mention of what the heck the allied scientists were doing with this problem during World War II. And I will follow in that tradition by also leaving out any mention of that during this talk. <laughs> the multi-armed bandit algorithms were also proposed a little bit after uh, for medical applications. So there, uh, instead of traditional randomized clinical trials where you pre-partition the subjects into groups of predefined sizes, which will be given different treatments, uh, you know, here, you make a sequence of decisions where initially some small subset of your subjects are given the blue pill, the red pill, the green pill. And afterward, when you know something about the effectiveness of those three treatments, you may choose to adjust the numbers of people who are given uh, each of the treatments in the next round of the trial. In some cases, maybe eliminating one treatment altogether from the trial because you have accumulated enough statistical evidence that it's known to be ineffective and it would be considered unethical to continue testing it on patients. Interestingly, although these methods were proposed as far back as the 1950s, uh, it took on the order of 30 years before they were actually adopted in clinical trials, and it's still not the case that the standard practice in medical clinical trials is to do adaptive experimentation using something like a multi on banded algorithm. Um, I am posing on this slide the question why and promising to return to that, although I say that a little bit sheepishly with some awareness that there are probably people in this room who know more about the subject than me and could provide uh, better answers than I will provide. I'll attempt to say something on that subject anyway. But, uh, you know, nowadays multi-armed bandits are absolutely everywhere. And unlike the 1950s when these things were being proposed but took 30 years to be adopted, now if you want to run a multi-armed bandit experiment on your website to see whether it's better to display the ad in the top left, top right, or lower right corner, uh, you know, you just have to go to Google and press a button and they'll start running the experiment for you. It's extremely easy to apply these algorithms. And they get applied for all sorts of things on the web. Ad placement, price experimentation, they get applied in crowdsourcing, search, and many other applications that I'm not listing here. And the theme of this talk will be to um, bring forward some of the mathematical challenges that come up when you try to apply these algorithms in these domains. Two themes that will occupy this talk are the loss of autonomy that results when the platform is not directly doing the experiments itself, but instead calling on users to autonomously decide to pull arms and report what they see. And also the supply and budget limits that uh, are kind of ubiquitous in the types of applications I was talking about with Amazon, for example, um, where as you're performing experiments, you're consuming resources, and when they run out, the learning process has to end. Okay. So. This, this uh, multi-armed bandit problem that was so baffling that the allied scientists didn't know what to do with it except uh, potentially inflict it on the Germans. How was it finally conquered? Uh, it was conquered by John Gittens, who developed uh, a beautiful type of solution called the Gittens Index Policy that in computer science terms we would say was a reduction from the many-armed bandit problem to a modified one-armed bandit problem. Um, so what Gittens looked at is a version of the multi-armed bandit where you have your n arms, each of which has some unobservable random property that I'll call its type, which completely determines the payoff distribution that you see every time you pull it. Um, and the gambler has some prior belief about the types, which is 
any, you know, it's a distribution that's uh, independent across arms. That's the only assumption that we'll make. And the type of average payoff that this person wants to optimize is a geometrically time discounted sum uh, with some discount rate gamma. Okay? And what I mean when I say that Gittins reduced this to a question about a single arm is uh, he said, here's how you should decide which of the n arms to pull at any point in time. Consider instead a decision problem where you only have two alternatives. Pull arm one or retire from the game, take a one-time payoff of size x, uh, and the entire process ends, okay? And, okay, so, so in this game, uh, we're gonna set it up so that you can pull arm one as many times as you want. At any time, you can opt out, get your retirement reward of size x. It'll be scaled down by gamma to the t if you retire at time t. And, you know, okay, if x equals zero, the retirement reward is useless and you should always pull arm one. And if x is sufficiently large, effectively infinity, then retirement is so attractive that you would never pull arm one, you would just immediately retire. And as I increase the value of x, there's some thresholds where the gambler becomes indifferent between retiring immediately or pulling the arm once to see what happens and then revisiting the decision whether to retire. That threshold value is called the Gittins index of arm one. And what Gittins showed is that if you now have a problem with any number of arms, to solve it, all you have to do is compute the index for each one of them, and always pick the arm with the highest index. It'll produce some payoff. Now you have more information about that arm, so you have to recompute its index, but that's all you do. You just pull an arm, recompute its index, again, maximize the index, pull that one, recompute. Um, it doesn't say anything about whether the Gittins index of one single arm is easy or hard to compute, but it does say that the complexity of the entire problem boils down to that one computation that you have to do. And it also provides us, I think, with a um, sort of beautiful structural insight into how to quantify the trade-off between exploration and exploitation, which is, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you have to uh, uh, do something non-myopic and try an alternative other than the one that you currently believe uh, to be the best. And the amount of boost that you have to give to the suboptimal alternatives about which you would like to learn more is completely characterized by this retirement reward notion. Okay. Um, so that's why this is a justly famous result. There's one other development in the history of these problems that I have to tell you about before I can get down into the thick of telling you about the research that I and my co-authors did. And that is a different model of the problem introduced by Lai and Robbins. They were trying to contend with the question of Gittins needs to assume the gambler knows so much. It has a complete prior about every arm that it might pull. Um, what if you just know that you have a bunch of arms, each of them has some payoff distribution, but you know nothing at all about that distribution, except maybe that it's normalized so that the payoffs are always between zero and one. What can you say? Uh, okay, so on the slide, a little bit inaccurately, I wrote no prob probabilistic assumption about arm types. Um, they make the probabilistic assumption that for any arm, it produces rewards that are IID over time. Other than that, no assumptions. Uh, okay. Bobby? Yes. It seems like there's another assumption, which is that it's bounded, so you can't. Yeah, bounded. you're right. You're right. The boundedness is, another, is an extra assumption. And are Thanks. Some arms independent? Uh, they don't need to assume independence. Uh, so, yeah, you get a tuple from the arms, which is independent across time. Um, somehow the question of independence across arms never even comes up in this problem because if you don't pull an arm, it's as if it didn't produce a payoff. So it's almost immaterial whether the model defines the payoff to exist at a time when you don't observe the arm. Okay, so in this model where you're not making any assumption about arm types, uh, it's actually quite subtle to try and capture what it means for an algorithm to be optimal. 
Well, the optimal algorithm is the one that has the highest expected payoff. Well, yeah, but we can't compute expected payoffs if we're not assuming a distribution on the arms. Okay, so they did something quite ingenious. They said, uh, we're, instead of asking what's the optimal algorithm, we're going to ask for a comparison between two parties. An uninformed gambler, that is an algorithm that doesn't know what distributions uh, underlie these arms and just has to find out by experimenting with them. And uh, an informed gambler who knows for every arm what uh, payoff distribution is going to produce and plays optimally. And just to spoil the least interesting part of the mystery for you, if you knew the payoff distribution of every arm, playing optimally means you compute the expected payoff for every arm. One of them has the highest expected payoff. You always pull that one. So the informed gambler has a very dull strategy in this game. And uh, they chose to frame the question in terms of how much worse is it to be an uninformed gambler and do learning versus being an informed one who's omniscient about the distributions <coughs> at time zero. The difference in payoff between those two parties they called regret. And they supplied an algorithm whose regret at time t grows only logarithmically in t. Which is a striking result because, uh, um, you know, in particular, the informed gambler knows strictly more information than the party playing the Gittins index policy in Gittins result on the last slide. And so, uh, you know, their uninformed algorithm, which has log t regret against a gambler that's omniscient about. Uh, the distributions. It's also doing within an additive log t of the payoff that the Gittins index policy would get, even though it knows nothing about the prior. Uh, so in some sense, this result is saying you thought that Gittins depended heavily on the prior, but if you're just willing to tolerate a small additive loss, you don't need to know the prior at all. What is this upper confidence bound algorithm? I'm not going to write it down for you, but it's based on a very simple intuition. Um, for every algorithm, you make the most optimistic possible guess about its average payoff that is consistent, statistically consistent with the evidence you've seen so far. That is to say, you plot a confidence interval such that you can say with very high probability that the actual average payoff lies in that interval. And then you optimistically guess that the upper endpoint of that interval is the true answer. You then always play the arm with the highest upper confidence estimate. And then you know, uh, writing down and analyzing the algorithm boils down to figuring out exactly how wide a confidence interval is statistically justified. And that's an easy problem that was solved long before these people. Nicole, did you have your hand raised? What does the Gittins index do with respect to the informed gambler? You mean, is it also behind by a uh, log t? I've never gotten that question, and I have never asked myself. Uh, it's not easy enough for me to answer on the fly. So I'm just going to say, great question. <laughs> no, but the Gittins index would need to know the distribution. Yeah, yeah that's he fine. He is the informed gambler, is he not? Yeah. No. The informed gambler is better than the Gittins index. No. Because Gittins, Gittins only knows the prior. Policy. He knows the posterior. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suspect that the log t gap exists even if you're comparing Gittins with the informed gambler, but it, it's a great question and I'm curious now to work it out. Is the yeah. log t an asymptotic result? Or it, the log t is an asymptotic result. Yeah, I was going to delay this until later in the talk, but that's a great question. Um, there's a worst case bound that this algorithm uh, with n arms does not have regret worse than constant times root t n log n at time t. It's also the case that for any profile of arm types, as you send t to infinity, the actual growth rate of regret is only order log t, but the, inside that big O, there's a constant that depends on the properties of the particular profile of arm types on which you're running the algorithm. So the hard instances of multi arm bandit have a very small gap between the best and second best. And ironically, although that means that there's a suboptimal alternative which is close to the optimum, so in some sense it's easier to find things that are near the optimum, 
it's so expensive to discriminate between the optimal and suboptimal one that in the short run you end up accumulating, it, sorry, in the, in the long run you end up accumulating a lot of regret trying to do that discrimination. Um, yeah, so the actual bound is like log t over epsilon squared where epsilon is the gap between the best and second best one. Yes? For reasonable distributions, how different are, is Lie Robbins and Giddens most of the time? Uh, it also depends on the discount rate. So for reasonable distributions and very slow discounting, they differ in their earlier in their early decisions. Yeah. Basically, after you've played every arm a few times, your priors become sharp enough that there's almost only one sensible thing to do, and both of these algorithms do it. And then the log t sort of comes from the fact that Lie Robbins, roughly every time t is a power of two, goes off and does something crazy just to make sure it's getting data about the other arm. Whereas Gittens exhibits incomplete learning in the long run where, uh, uh, you know, arm A may be better than arm B, and Gittens might end up playing arm B forever because of some initial data it sees that sent it off in the wrong direction. Um, so a, a, a given sample path of Lie Robbins versus Gittens could be quite different because of this phenomenon of incomplete learning. But you know, sort of their average pay, their average behavior over many sample paths will look quite similar after the initial time slice. Okay. Um, oh, Aaron, you had a question? Yeah, wait, wait, wait. You just said that Gittins has a predefined probability of forever the wrong arm? Yeah. So does that imply, like, that the... Infinite regret? Like a linear. A linear regret? It has to do with the fact that Lie and Robbins are computing an undiscounted regret, and uh, Gittins is computing geometrically time discounted. So what happens is Gittens can run off and forever play the wrong alternative, but the sum of regrets that it experiences uh, when doing that uh, adds up to a finite sum because it's geometrically discounted. Yeah, yeah. But don't you send gamma to one? You can send gamma to one, but I don't think that the sequence of Gittins index policies converges to a well-defined policy as you do that. Okay, so I promised you a couple speculations on why uh, it took so long to adopt banded algorithms in medical trials and why the adoption is still incomplete. Um, I've presented you with sort of the two main families of banded algorithms, the Gittins index policies and the upper confidence bound ones. And Gittins index policies are beautiful but fragile, so uh, it depends on every assumption that I made on that slide. The geometric discounting instead of some other discounting scheme, uh, independent priors over arms. Uh, in practice, people doing a medical test probably don't have precise priors about the success probabilities of their treatments. Uh, if they did, they would probably be correlated. They also don't get instantaneous feedback. In the multi-arm bandit problem, it's important that you pull an arm of the slot machine, you instantly see its payoff. In a medical trial, it could be months or longer. Um, and in medicine, the objective is not to maximize the discounted number of successes. The objective is somehow to advance science and eventually make medical discoveries that lead to life-saving breakthroughs. And so, um, for all these reasons, it's not obvious that you would want to apply the Gittins index policy. Um, but, but Pavi, did, is there any reason to believe that any of those objections that you said bring us any closer to anything that they're currently doing, rather than even further away from what they're currently doing in the direction that this suggests? You were one of the people in the room who I anticipated might have a more nuanced answer to this question than me. So now uh, I'm feeling very on the spot. Uh, I'm not sure I got your question. Is there any reason you said to believe that these objections, would make it if more overcome, no, no, would, no. It's, is there any reason to believe that these objections move you towards what is current practice 
relative to what is suggested by Giddens, rather than moving you even further from current practice than is suggested by Giddens? In other words, like... Well, I don't know. So, so, so let's talk about delayed observations. If we're going to run a trial and I decide beforehand that uh, 500 people are going to get treatment A and 500 are going to get treatment B, that completely removes the problem of delayed observations because I've already predetermined who's going to get which treatment. I don't have to wait until I see any observations. Um, uh, correlated success probability. In, in, the, in the really stereotyped case where I, every time I run a trial with two alternatives, I'm going to pre-partition into 50-50 groups, that also takes away any, ha any having to reason about priors because, I, hey, I already know I'm going to do 50-50 because that's what the handbook tells me to do. So now, I thought your question was going to say, do we have any reason to believe if these four objections could be overcome, that would bring us any closer to bandits being used in medicine? I, I think I have to stay mute on that subject. There are lots of other things like privacy concerns, and also just the fact that it's not as if medicine is you know, a single organized entity like Microsoft where you can say from the top down, we're going to do things this way from now on. <laughs> uh, but OK, in the interest of getting to the remaining bullets on my slide. Actually, the other, the, a much more important problem is that you don't want your clinicians to know how the trials are coming out during the time, because they may leak that to the patients and make the placebo effect worse. And so keeping so, that completely secret has another advantage, whereas Gittins requires somebody to know. Yep. That's a very good point. Uh, yeah, in fact, I guess we just learned about that one on Monday at the workshop on uh, uh, experimentation in the web. OK, so, so we also have this other class of algorithms, UCB, that needs to make much fewer probabilistic assumptions. Um, and in that sense, is more flexible. Uh, but as I said in answering the question that came from that corner of the room, uh, those policies suffer from slow convergence, so they're more suitable for experiments where you're doing a million trials, let's say, rather than a thousand. Okay. So on the web, oftentimes these objections go away. Uh, it's very easy to run an experiment at n equals one million. Uh, you don't have humans in the loop making the decisions, so the sorts of worries that Preston, for example, just expressed about humans deviating from the protocol once they know the outcome of earlier experiments uh, go away. Although hold on to that thought because it'll return when I get to talking about the first paper in a second. Um, also, the, on the web, the stakes are much lower than in World War II or in the practice of doing medicine. If you make a mistake in what price you quote to a user on Amazon, nobody dies. Okay, so in fact, uh, I think you know the the circumstances are right in our generation for these algorithms coming into widespread use, and in fact, that seems to be happening. And this talk is going to be about two pieces of research about what comes up when these algorithms do start coming into widespread use. Okay, so the first one is on a paper called Incentivized Exploration. Uh, I have here a picture of Ferdinand and Isabella giving Christopher Columbus his incentive for exploring North America. Um, but unlike in the days when monarchs could just order people to go on voyages of discovery for us, um, nowadays we have many platforms that want users to do the equivalent of voyages of discovery for them, but they don't have monarchical power over their users. So Amazon, for example, depends on you to review products so that it can provide good recommendations to other users. Um, it's therefore in Amazon's interest for its users to provide reviews on a diverse set of products, but any individual user uh, just cares about getting the product that's right for them. Um, and you see this all over, you know, so uh, social news reader sites also depend on you reviewing articles in order to make good recommendations to other people. Citizen science platforms like Galaxy Zoo or eBird depend on uh, a user base that is going out birding or looking at the sky just for fun, 
but their project only succeeds if that user base collects a diverse set of observations. Um, and you can even see this uh, phenomenon playing out in the arena of funding for science, um, where you often hear things about the difficulty of encouraging resource researchers uh, to do high stakes, potentially transformative research. And how should an organization like the NSF provide the right incentives for them to do that? In all of these situations, what's happening is a case of misaligned incentives that you have a principal whose goal is to collect data about many alternatives and you have users who each individually just want to select uh, what they perceive to be the best alternative. Or in even pithier terms, you have a principal whose goal is to exploit and use, uh, a principal who wants to explore and users who want to exploit. And uh, the question is how much efficiency loss results from that misalignment of incentives or how to bring them more in line with each other. Okay, given the preamble of this talk, it's natural that this problem can be modeled as a multi-armed bandit. And so, you know, we have uh, K arms with independent random types. And, uh, you know, the only thing that changes from the multi-armed bandit problem I presented to you before is that for every time step, we have a separate user. User T participates only in time step T, chooses an arm IT, and sees a reward R sub T. Um, we're going to assume history is fully observable. So user T sees everything that happened in rounds 1 through T minus 1 before making its selection. And we're going to assume that everybody has a common prior. Okay, so, uh, you know, in this model, the principle is trying to do exactly what the Gittins index policy wants to do, maximize discounted rewards. And a user just wants to, the user who participates at time t just wants to maximize that component of the sum. In, in addition to common prior, do you also assume that the user has no information that would allow you to update the prior about the nature of the Gittins index and um, stuff? Yes. You're asking if users have private signals in addition to the common prior. No, no, there are no private signals in this model. Uh, everybody's initialized to a common prior and they share a common history, so they always have common posteriors. Um, so the, I, the only reason for treating the users as distinct at all is to remove the intertemporal incentives between user S and user T for a different time step. It, it just might be kind of interesting if there was some way you were trying to exploit the private signals of the agents as well. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so, uh, right, in, in this model, the principal has some optimal policy. The users left to their own devices would pursue a myopic policy. We've already talked about the optimal policy. It's given by uh, the Gittins index. The myopic policy is simply at any time step t, everybody has a common posterior. There's one arm which has the highest expected reward under that posterior, and that's the one that would be myopically pulled. Um, a first question you might ask is, how much worse is it to just play the myopic policy than to follow the optimal one? And uh, you know, one of the things our paper does is it gives a tight uh, answer to that question. So the myopic policy always gets at least one minus gamma fraction of the optimal policy, and this bound is tight. Um, that means that if the principle is very patient, so this counting time very slowly, gamma is close to one, and this is saying that the myopic is greater than epsilon fraction of the optimum, but that's not a very compelling guarantee. And so uh, if you want to do better than the fully myopic policy in one of these crowdsourced investigation platforms, you have to provide the users with some incentives to be non-myopic. And our model is going to incorporate that by saying that the principal can post a vector of rewards at time t, saying if you choose alternative i at time t, in addition to whatever random reward you get from pulling that arm, I'm also going to pay you an extra C sub T I. And that changes the incentives for the agents so that now they're maximizing expected reward plus this incentive payment. And, you know, crucially, C I T is under the control of the platform designer so they can try to use those to bring the user's behavior closer in line with optimal exploration. 
at this point, it's relevant to go back and do a sanity check and ask whether this model has anything to do with the applications that I said were motivating this research. So we're not envisioning that Amazon would actually post a bounty, you know, uh, and say we're giving you this reward for, you know, we, we believe this digital camera really sucks, but if you buy it, we'll give you this reward for, uh, you know, for taking one for the team. Um, but, you know, uh, so in the product reviewing context, you could imagine that the reward is silently being applied as a discount. So the user just sees a lower price and doesn't know that that price actually incorporates this reward. Um, in other contexts, like citizen science, the reward might be a social psychological reward. We're going to give you a badge for being the first person to explore this hitherto unseen part of the sky. Or, okay. Um, or in the scientific funding context. The reward might be an implicit reward in the form of a promise of greater funding probability. So if you choose to work on this problem where you have low probability of success, uh, we'll incentivize that by promising that a certain proportion of our funds have been set aside for funding exactly that type of research. Okay. So uh, now that I've told you uh, our model of how the principle is going to incentivize agents to choose arms, uh, I can talk about the main question that we sought to solve. So uh, if the principle applies some incentive policy pi, determining the payments uh, CIT that it offers at time t, and the agents best respond to that policy, there will be some expected time discounted reward, which will be some fraction of the optimum. Call it 1 minus a. And you know, think of A as like the opportunity cost of not following the optimal policy. And the principal will have to pay out in expectation some other amount, uh, B times opt. Okay? So these A and B reflect two different types of costs that the principal takes on. Uh, one is the opportunity cost of suboptimal exploration, and the other is the incentive cost of bringing people's behavior closer in line with what would optimally be done. And, okay, we'll say that policy pi achieves loss pair AB. And then the crucial definition, a pair AB is achievable if for every instance of the multi-armed bandit problem, there always exists a policy achieving loss pair A comma B. Okay, so now the main question should be clear. We want to know what is the set of achievable loss pairs. And one thing that I find charming about this question is it actually lets you plot in a visual way the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So I, you know, I've, uh, I've been working on multi-armed bandit problems for a long time. My PhD thesis was on multi-armed bandit problems. I cannot tell you how many times I've given a talk where in the first few slides I said, the multi-armed bandit model is all about the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. But if someone had confronted me and said, oh, there's a trade-off, can you plot the curve of, you know, how much more exploration you get to do if you do less exploitation. Not only would I not know the shape of the curve, but I wouldn't even know what the question was asking. But this is a model where you can very cleanly say, uh, you know, you have to pay people this much to explore, and this is how much you lost because uh, they were exploiting. And, uh, okay, so, once I realized that this curve is, in pictorial form, the exploration-exploitation trade-off, I was, of course, very curious to know its shape. And our paper answers that question. So a uh, loss pair is achievable if and only if the sum of the square roots of A and B is greater than or equal to the square root of gamma. Um, well, it, it's interesting that it's such a simple equation, um, but let me try to highlight uh, you know, some of the more enlightening qualitative features here. So the achieve uh, okay, this bullet consists of things that you would expect if you just thought about the problem for a second. So, uh, like, if, if A, B, and A prime, B prime are both achievable, then any point on the line segment between them is also achievable because I could, to get the midpoint, for example, I could just toss a fair coin at the beginning and decide if I'm going to run a policy achieving A, B, or one that achieves A prime, B prime, okay? So, we knew that the achievable region was going to be convex. We knew it was going to be upward monotone because you could always just pay people more. So if, you know, if, if any point is in the achievable region, I can pay them more and get some point that lies uh, directly above it. 
it's intuitive that it is setwise decreasing in the discount factor. So as the discount rate gamma gets closer to one and the principal becomes more patient, the misalignment of incentives between the principal and agents becomes more severe, and so you would expect fewer points to be achievable. It's satisfying to see that the theorem bears out that intuition. Um, and I think the most interesting aspect that was certainly not obvious to us at the start before we derived this theorem is there are some uh, pairs that are achievable no matter the discount factor. So, so you, you can make it infinitesimally close to one. You can make the principal almost infinitely patient. And still, there's a policy where you get at least three quarters of the payoff of the optimal policy while giving back only 25% of the optimal reward to the users in the form of incentive payments. Similarly, if you want to get 90% of the optimal policy, you never have to pay more than 50% of the optimal reward back to them in the form of incentive payments. Okay. So, I now have a sequence of slides talking about how we derived this result. Uh, let me see, I'm going to have to skip over some of them. Um, to delineate the achievable region exactly, you have to do two things. You have to show that every point in it is achievable and every point outside of it is unachievable. Okay? The, the easier one is the unachievability. Um, there's a hard type of instance for this problem that we call diamonds in the rough, where there's uh, a very large, effectively infinite number of arms that you just have to observe them once, and as the first time you look at them, you know what their payoff is. We call those collapsing arms. And each of them produces a gigantic, effectively infinite payoff, but with a tiny probability, and otherwise payoff zero. There's also one option that's a sure thing that produces a payoff of phi. And now as you vary this parameter phi, you get a one parameter family of instances that are hard because there's the safe option that the users would like to always pick. And there's the unsafe option that has, there's a lottery ticket that has a tiny probability of paying off, but you really want the, to get them to do that because in the long run, it's going to be worth more to the principal. Okay. For each of these diamond in the rough instances, the two extreme points of the achievable region correspond to an optimal policy that always picks one of the risky alternatives until the high payoff is found, and a myopic policy that always plays the safe arm. So for any value of phi, you get an achievable region that looks like this polygon. Everything in the white triangle is therefore unachievable. And as I move phi around, the union of these white triangles completely maps out the complement of the purple region. So now we're just left with showing that every point in the purple region is achievable. That's where it gets hard. Um, and the basic idea is to use the separating hyperplane theorem. So uh, I have a point AB, which is in the purple region. And I want to uh, reason by contradiction. Suppose the achievable region instead were this yellow one that does not contain that point. Because we know it's convex, there must be a separating hyperplane, a line that goes through AB, but lies completely outside of the achievable region. Okay, so, so now that line has some slope uh, negative lambda that can be used to make uh, a one parameter, okay, so, right, the, I've stated incentivized exploration as a Pareto optimization problem. You have these two numbers, A and B, and you're trying to make both of them small. Okay. But the benefit of focusing on this line of slope lambda is it gives me an exchange rate for converting opportunity cost and incentive cost into a single number that an algorithm can try to optimize. And so, you know, the main part of, an, of our analysis then goes into figuring out uh, for a given value of lambda, what's the largest value that we can guarantee a policy can achieve for this mixed sign objective function of payoff minus lambda times cost? All right, and our paper defines something called a time-expanded policy 
that provably achieves the value that you would achieve if you were facing the diamond in the rough instance. Okay, so in conclusion, in this part of the talk, I presented uh, yeah, I presented this problem of incentivizing exploration that asks how cheaply we can incentivize selfish, myopic users to explore a set of alternatives. The main result completely characterized uh, when you can uh, say with certainty that a certain opportunity cost is achievable at a certain price. And uh, you know there are many open questions. From a practical standpoint, one would want to enhance our model with various features like hard budget constraints. Right now, I say that AB is achievable if there's a policy where the expected amount that it pays out is B times the optimum. Oftentimes, the learner would want to know that they never pay more than B times the optimum on any sample path of this learning process. Um, you know, a very interesting question is about uh, when users are non-myopic, you know, so like in the Amazon product reviewing setting, our model is making the unreasonable assumption that people are going to use the system exactly once, contribute one re review, and then go away forever. And one would like a model where users return in the future and may make non-myopic decisions accounting for the future state of the system when they are likely to come back. Um, also, I don't, not from a practical standpoint, but just from an intellectual curiosity standpoint, the answer to our question turned out to have a spooky symmetry that if A comma B is achievable, then so is B comma A. And that symmetry shows up nowhere in the proof. That it, everything we do is completely asymmetrical with respect to exploring and exploiting, and then at the very end, some cancellations happen, and we get an answer which is symmetric under interchanging uh, the two axes. There's something dissatisfying about that because, you know, uh, symmetries like this usually don't just happen by accident. So it'd be interesting to know if there's some duality principle that says for every multi arm bandit instance, there's a dual instance that exchanges the costs of exploring and exploiting. Okay. But I want to reserve five minutes for telling you about this other paper, Bandits with Knapsacks, that addresses a completely different uh, aspect of the multi arm bandit problem, which is how to deal with supply or budget constraints during the learning process. So, um, you know, typical scenario that motivates this problem is you're selling seats on an airplane using uh, price experimentation. So maybe you don't know how much this flight is worth to people and you're going to offer varying prices to your users in an effort to converge in on the profit maximizing price for airplane seats, okay? But this problem is not like the ordinary multi arm bandit because every time someone accepts a price that you offered, one seat on the plane is now reserved. And when the number of uh, seats for sale drops down to zero, the learning process is over and you can't do anymore. Uh, you see the same thing in crowdsourcing where you may be using Amazon Mechanical Turk to collect image labels and you may have been given a budget of size B for this project. Um, every time uh, you ask someone to provide a label for your image, you have to decide how much money to offer them. But when your budget is used up, you can't ask for any more labels. So you're just trying to maximize the number of labels you get before exhausting your budget. Okay, so there's a general model that encompasses all of these problems and many more. Where we have N arms as before, we now also have D supply limited resources. And every time you pull an arm, now two things happen. You get a reward R, which is between zero and one. And you get some random vector in D dimensions, which says how much of each resource was consumed. And the learner has to stop when some resource is fully consumed. Okay, so you could plot the learning process uh, in some, you know, in D dimensions. Maybe there are two dimensions, the money spent and the time until the experiment ends. And any sample path, I'm not showing rewards, but I'm showing resource consumption. It adds up, and when we hit the boundary of this region, it means that we've exhausted one resource, in this case money, and the process is over. Okay. And it's easy to represent, uh, you know, like the Mechanical Turk example or the airline seats example in this model. 
And because we allow for a multi-dimensional resource constraint, you can actually represent much more, such as selling seats on multi-hop itineraries, where there's many planes and any given user, you, know, you, you may have uh, you know, a thousand planes that you're operating, so you're in a thousand dimensions. Any given user may use up three of those dimensions at once. Um, or you could have you know, a web advertising uh, context where you have a thousand advertisers, and every time you decide to place an ad, you use up some of that advertiser's budget, but there's actually a thousand separate budgets, one for each advertiser. Okay. One of the things that makes this problem hard is that unlike the Lie and Robbins setting, where the ideal was to figure out the best single arm and always pull it, in these problems, the best thing to do might be to pull a mixture of arms. You can even see that in this two-dimensional picture. If you have one arm which shoots off along a ray that hits this wall, and another arm whose expected resource consumption shoots off along a ray and hits the ceiling, it might be better to do a mixture of those two arms that takes aim at that corner and thereby gets to keep playing for a longer amount of time before exhausting any resource. Okay. So you see, defining regret in relation to the best fixed arm is actually the wrong thing to do for this problem. And I'll spare you this entire slide. The, the right thing to do is to define regret in relation to the informed gambler, someone who knows the distribution of rewards and resource consumptions for every arm, and always picks, uh, you know, it, the optimal solution of the gigantic dynamic programming problem defined by that set of distributions. You know, your, your state is whatever remaining supply you have of each resource, and um, in principle, you could solve an exponentially large dynamic program and figure out that optimal policy. That's the informed gambler, and you want to do nearly as well. So our main result is that there is an algorithm whose regret is small with respect to the informed gambler. It's small to the extent that the fraction of the optimum payoff that you must sacrifice is bounded by this expression which tends to zero as you hold the number of arms fixed and send both the budget and the value of the optimum payoff to infinity. It's intuitive that you need both of those to be asymptotically large because if you have tiny budgets, then it could be that in a single trial you consume all or almost all of your budget uh, of one resource and then you never have time to do learning. And similarly, if the optimum payoff is tiny, then getting the optimum payoff depends on what happens in just a very small number of rounds, and the learner has no time to do learning before that number of rounds elapses. Um, although its analysis is difficult, our algorithm has a very simple structure. Um, it's always pulling an arm to maximize a cost-benefit ratio. So now that you have multiple resources, you don't just want to pick the arm that gives you the greatest reward. You want to get, pick the arm that gives you the most bang for the buck given how much resource you expect it to consume. Okay? The difficulty is since we have many resources, the cost is not easily expressed as a single scalar. And yet you want to be picking an arm to maximize uh, the ratio of benefit to cost. So what our algorithm does is it simultaneously tries to learn two things. Uh, the best arm to play, and also a vector of exchange rates, P, that tells you how you should be trading off consuming the different resources against each other. Okay, and the way that's done is we estimate rewards using upper confidence bounds and resource consumption using lower confidence bounds. In each case, that's the most optimistic estimate you could make about that parameter, so it's in keeping with the lie robbins philosophy. Uh, we pull an arm that uh, minimizes the estimated, or maximizes the estimated ratio of benefit to cost is actually the easier way to think about it. And then we update our vector of exchange rates using a multiplicative update that'll be familiar to any algorithm theorist who has used algorithms in this family before. Um, it's a familiar update rule for approximately solving fractional packing problems in an iterative manner. Okay. Uh, so the intuition for the algorithm is LP duality says there exists a price vector such that if you just knew the right vector of exchange rates, the optimum policy would only play cost benefit minimizing arms and would uh, fully consume every resource with positive price. 
What we're doing instead is we're simultaneously running two algorithms interleaved. A learning algorithm that uses multiplicative weights to try learning the vector of exchange rates, and then a UCB algorithm that is doing something like live robins given current estimates. And the difficulty in the analysis is from analyzing the feedback loop between those two algorithms and showing that errors, rather than accumulating, um, uh, tend to shrink to zero over time fast enough that we get the regret bound in that main theorem. Okay. Um, I have a slide about subsequent work. I'm not going to tell you, uh, it, in, in less than a year since our paper came out, two very nice follow-up papers have come out. And since this is the Microsoft Research Colloquium, I feel I ought to at least advertise the two papers for you because of the five combined authors, all of them are at Microsoft Research in one location or another. Um, Ashwin was an intern at Microsoft New York City where these other two authors are. Shipra and Nikhil uh, are at Microsoft Bangalore and Redmond uh, respectively. So uh, this is a problem that has attracted great interest and follow-up work within Microsoft Research. And these two papers taken together really generalize our results in exciting new directions. And um, you know, I was very glad to see other people picking up on this problem and improving our algorithms in various ways. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that the web has created a fertile environment for doing high throughput low stakes, algorithmically mediated sequential experiments, and that this is creating exactly the right conditions for these algorithms that have been a wellspring of great theory since my grandparents' generation uh, to finally start getting widespread use in practice. In this talk, I have uh, told you about research on two of the issues that I think will come up as they start to be applied in practice. And uh, if you were to ask me to summarize what lies ahead in the form of a one-sentence grand challenge, I would say um, the multi-armed bandit provides a great theory of explore-exploit trade-offs in stateless environments where what you did in the past may influence your state of knowledge but doesn't constrain your future decisions or influence your future payoffs at all. Um, uh, so that very se cleanly separates learning from all of the other, uh, you know, sort of past, future dependencies that happen in online algorithms. But now that we actually want to apply these things, uh, the interesting challenges lie where you have problems that are stateful. Uh, it, these two examples actually fit that mold. So in the bandits with knapsacks problem, you have a state vector, which is your remaining resource endowment. And that is, uh, you know, some form of weak state dependence between the past and, it's, it's a way that the past is constraining your future decisions. And in incentivized exploration, the past is also constraining the future payoffs that you have to give people. If in the past something happened that revealed one arm to be myopically optimal, now you're going to have to pay people more in the present to get them to try other alternatives. Okay? So uh, you know, both of these papers illustrate that it might be possible to make progress on this grand challenge. I think now is the right time to be trying. Thank you very much.